Can stars have rings? Could we see the same star at different times? And can balloons launch rockets? All this and more in this week's question show. Welcome to New Year and another question show. Your questions, my answers. Now, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I will gather them up and I will answer them here. I do the show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time on the YouTube channel. So if you want to get your questions answered live, ask follow up questions, talk to the rest of the people who are watching, that's a good way to do it. So just join the show. It should be a reminder here on my channel so you can watch it. But before we get into the questions, it's time for a book club update. And of course, the book club is where you club me with book recommendations. We have a discussion group on Goodreads that you can go and make book recommendations to me. I will choose one that I'm interested in. I will read the book and I will report back. So this week, the book is called Revelation Space by Alistair Reynolds. And I've had a bunch of people recommend this book to me. It's been on one of my top lists. I finally got around to reading it. And wow, what a book. Uh, now it has a very similar vibe to the three body problem. So it has these concepts that are at the very end of physics as we understand them or don't understand them. But where it improves on the three body problem is the characters are really good. <laughs> like with the three body problem, the ideas are really mind bending. But with Revelation Space, the characters are terrific. And at the same time, the ideas are also mind bending. The technology is really crazy. So if, if you want to sort of read a book that's like a blend between the three body problem and the culture series by Ian M. Banks, this book Revelation Space will be right up your alley. I think it's one of the best science fiction books I've read in a long time. So I highly recommend it and you're gonna love it. So thanks to everybody who recommended this book to me. Keep them coming. There'll be a link to the Goodreads discussion in the show notes down below. All right, let's get into the questions. Richard Gabriel. Hey, Fraser, love your content as always. My question is, is it possible for a star to have rings? Absolutely. Now, let's think about rings. Now you're familiar with Saturn's rings, of course, and these are these enormous, beautiful, icy rings made of material that either Saturn crushed one of its moons or material formed in place probably crushed a moon um, and has been orbiting the planet ever since. Now, if Saturn was closer to the sun, then the radiation and heat from the light from the sun would melt it all away and Saturn's rings would would disappear. That's what's happening to comets, right? Comets grow tails because they're getting ablated by the radiation from the sun. And there's a thing called the frost line, and it's roughly halfway in the asteroid belt. And so if you get closer to the sun than the asteroid belt, then things like comets and Saturn's rings can't exist, because they're just getting blasted away by the sun's radiation. But if you go beyond the frost line, out towards Jupiter, then icy objects can exist. And of course, that's why you've got ice moons around Jupiter and Saturn and so on. So Saturn's rings wouldn't exist if they were close to a star because that's going to be closer than the frost line. But the other kind of rings that you can have are made of dust or rock. And it's believed that say the rings of Neptune or Uranus, these are dark and dusty, probably made of more rock than ice. But you know, we're still not entirely sure. And that's why we need to send a mission to Uranus or Neptune, please. Could you have a ring of dust around a star? Totally. And in fact, many do. So when a newly forming star is starting to build up its planets around it, it creates this accretion disk, this giant protoplanetary disk that surrounds the star. And it's made of rock and dust and metal and gas. And over time, this material comes together and to form the planets and then the radiation from the sun blasts away all the remaining material and then the planets are free to orbit around the star. And astronomers have seen many examples of these planetary disks, these enormous ring like structures around stars. And we'll show you a link. This is an image of 20 different 
protoplanetary disks seen by the National Radio Astronomical Observatory. I forget which one. It's one of the submillimeter telescopes. And it's all of these different protoplanetary disks that you can see. And these are actual photographs of these disks, not just artists illustrations. And this is the level this is the state of modern astronomy. But I'm, you're probably not thinking like, could we get, you know, rings of material f that will eventually form planets like you're probably thinking like, can we just get like rings, man. And so there's one other time you could get rings around a star. And that's when the star has destroyed a planet. So whenever a planet gets too close to the star, it falls within this region called the Roche limit. And the Roche limit is essentially the point at which the tidal forces, the force of gravity on the front of the planet, compared to the force of gravity on the far side of the planet is so different, that the actual structural capability of the planet to hold itself together as a sphere fails. And so the planet just gets sheared apart into pieces. And then those pieces get sheared apart into more pieces and more pieces. And eventually you've got a ring. And so if a planet gets too close to the star, it's going to get torn up into a ring. And I don't think we know of any examples of rings around like regular main sequence stars like like the sun, but we definitely have seen debris disks around white dwarf stars, dead stars. And I guess they have killed their planets as they died in their death throes. So yeah, absolutely. Stars can totally have rings. And by studying those rings, astronomers can learn a tremendous amount about the star itself and get a sense of where planets come from. All right, I suppose you've noticed the Star Wars planet names that are appearing over top of my shoulder this one. And these are of course your way to be able to vote. So this is the code word that you'll use to write in the comments down below, which was your favorite question this week, or your favorite answer, or your favorite question answer combination. So last time, the winner was uh, Roger Myers Jr. asking about whether or not I would explain the Black Knight satellite and so that they could talk to their conspiracy theorist friends about it. And my answer was no, I won't. And apparently you enjoyed that. So congratulations to uh, to Roger and uh, thanks everyone who voted. Remember, vote uh, for the all of the questions this week down in the comments down below and then ask your own question or just put the name of the Star Wars planet that you like. People have asked why we don't do Star Trek planets and I think it's because now it's a habit. It should be star it should be it should be uh, Stargate planets. But anyway, all right, Neil Easton, could gravitational lensing as seen in the JWST deep field could be used to see one star at two different time periods? And if so, how valuable would that information be? And what discoveries might be made? Yes. And in fact, this something like this has actually been seen. So in the case of a gravitational lens, you've got a foreground object, say a galaxy cluster, and then you've got a background object, say a galaxy, and then the light from the galaxy is passing really close to the foreground object, and it gets distorted and twisted, like the lens of a telescope. And in some cases, the light is bent multiple times around the foreground object, and you can see reflections of this background object multiple times. Sort of the classic example of this is called an Einstein ring where you've got almost this perfect ring shaped structure around the foreground object. And that's really just a background galaxy that's been twisted and torn apart into into this image. It's not it hasn't actually been torn apart. It's just that its image has been distorted. So you've got the foreground object, like some kind of galaxy cluster, and then you've got this distorted view of the background object that is wrapping around the foreground object, and you can use it as a natural telescope lens to be able to see it. And there are many situations where these gravitational lenses will actually show you multiple versions of the same galaxy where the light is going one way around the foreground object and going the other way around the foreground object. And then you're seeing two versions, but there's really only one galaxy back there. Now, you wouldn't really be able to know is there any difference in the light travel time between these different objects because 
galaxies last for billions of years, stars last for billions of years, how would you know how long the photons have been traveling for? Except there has been a situation where you can see something special happening. And this is where you've got this galaxy that's in the background, and it's had a supernova. And so this is a very discreet, very specific moment of time. And astronomers saw one example where there was a gravitational lens of the same galaxy, where they could see the same supernova go off simultaneously in all of these different reflections. But here's the crazy part. There was one more that didn't have the supernova going off. And astronomers estimate that we'll see the supernova go off in that other reflection in about 20 years. And that's because the light has taken longer to take this one journey around the gravitational lens than all of the other ones. And, and that's incredibly valuable, because knowing how long the light took to follow this journey tells you the shape gives you a sense of what obstacles did the light have to go through? How why did it have to go on a longer path to go one way around this galaxy cluster than the other way? And it allows you to probe what the actual gravitational lens is made of how much dark matter is there? How much regular matter is there? How is it organized around this area? So it's it's a fairly fresh discovery, I think it was only seen about a year ago. And I'm assuming other versions of this have been seen in James Webb, I'm sure we'll find many, many examples of this in the future. So yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. Moody Mongol. There must be a reason why this hasn't been done. Why not use an airship to get to near orbit, same height say as a weather balloon and then launch a vehicle from there into space? I figure that most modern material science is good enough to allow designing this, it wouldn't be the fastest way to orbit, but it seems economical to me for quite a few reasons. People have absolutely thought about this idea of carrying a rocket to high altitude and then launching it from there. In fact, there is a terrible, terrible word for this. It's called a raccoon. And I just I feel dirty just saying the word. But there you go. And so many people have thought about whether or not you could actually use a balloon as a platform for launching rockets or an airship or whatever. And in fact, there is a company called JP Aerospace, who I interviewed on the weekly space hangout a couple of years ago. And he's working on prototypes of different balloons designed to carry rockets up and, and serve as like a launch platform at extremely high altitude to be able to launch rockets from. But there's a big downside to launching rockets from a balloon. And that's because being at a high altitude isn't the hard part about getting into space. It's about going sideways. So when you think about objects that are in orbit around the Earth, they're going 28,000 kilometers per hour sideways. And they're going so fast that they are falling exactly at the same rate that the Earth is curving away from them so that they don't actually hit the ground. And so it's not about carrying yourself to a high altitude. It's about getting yourself to that sideways velocity. And when rockets take off, they do have to get through some air resistance. And so some fuel is used to get them through the thicker parts of the atmosphere. But the vast majority of it is used to take them sideways. And so a balloon would be great, it would help you have a lower complexity of a rocket less fuel, but not a lot. And the problem then is like, just imagine the complexity, like with something like Starship or something with like a Falcon 9, it's just sitting there on the launch pad, engineers can go out, they can work on it, they can tinker on it, they can fuel it, they can put the cargo in the astronauts can climb on board, if there's a problem, they can get off again, and take the elevator back down and try again tomorrow. But if you're up on a balloon, like just imagine the logistics involved to to carry all of this material up to this high altitude, and then try to launch your rocket from that platform, it's going to be complicated. So people are considering it. And there's been interesting hybrid ideas to be able to launch rockets from balloons, but we haven't seen it take off because it's, it's, it's not simple. And rockets are simple, launching from the ground. Cliff Cottell. Hey, Fraser, question for my eight year old daughter, what would happen if time stopped? That's a really interesting question, man, kids are fiendish with their questions. And to be honest, 
I can't think of anything that would happen because everything that happens requires time. So assuming like if time just stopped, and then it started again, it would feel like time had not stopped. And we don't really have any practical examples of this, but there is one that's kind of weird. And that is the experience of a photon like light. So when the sun gives off light, it gives off this radiation in the form of photons, and they are traveling away from the sun at the speed of light. And then they arrive and hit your skin. And you then feel the warmth from the sun. And there's been an unimpeded journey from the sun to hitting you in the face with the with the sunlight. And from our perspective, those photons traveled through space for a little over eight minutes to reach us. But from the perspective of the photons themselves, no time elapsed that they were released from the sun, and then they instantaneously were absorbed by your skin and no time elapsed in between those. And so from the perspective of a photon, time stopped, which is really weird. But uh, but that's all I can think of. But then I'm not a physicist. I'm, I'm just a journalist. CMS 1999 does Elon slash Twitter impact spaceflight confidence. I know that Elon taking over Twitter has impacted the confidence for Tesla. And I haven't heard anyone specifically saying that there's been any issues with the commitments to SpaceX. Um, I think there was a conference recently, someone asked the NASA administrator if Elon's distractions with Twitter was going to be a problem for the work with NASA. And the, and the gist is Gwen Shotwell is running SpaceX, and she is really solid and really knows what she's doing. She's a master operator. And so I think as long as Gwen Shotwell is in charge of the operations at SpaceX, there shouldn't be any major issues. So I haven't heard anything like I personally am, am surprised that Elon Musk has time for running Twitter at the same time as running Tesla and running SpaceX. I wouldn't want to take on running a social media company. But I haven't heard of any specific um, projects getting into trouble because of this situation so far. Starlink is continuing to expand. SpaceX launched more rockets in 2022, I think it was 60 rockets in 2022. And I'm sure they'll launch more in 2023. Starship didn't fly. But you know, many, many new developments were made. So I would probably like I said, I'd probably put a lot of that emphasis on on Gwen Shot Will's work at running SpaceX. Um, but it's like there's 1000s of engineers there who are really good at what they do. And I think it's really hard to single out any one person at this point, when the company has this much momentum. But if anything does change, I'll definitely let you know. It's my job to report on this kind of thing. And so I'll be watching to see if there's any issues. But so far, I haven't seen anything. But if you know of anything, let me know in the comments below. John Ship, why do scientists claim that there could be life on some of the outer moons despite the temperature being well below life sustaining levels? How could life survive or even begin in such frigid temperatures? Yeah, the surface of Europa, the surface of Titan is very, very cold. You are way below freezing temperatures on Titan, you are cold enough that methane turns into a liquid, there are lakes of liquid methane on the surface of Titan. But if you go down below these thick shells of ice down dozens of kilometers, you get to a point where there's liquid water under and it's caused by the tidal interactions between the moon and the planet. So the interactions between all of Jupiter's large moons, cause this tidal flexing, and the flexing releases heat inside the moon, and you can see it with Io like Io has is the most volcanically active place in the solar system. And that's caused by the tidal flexing its interactions with the gravity of Jupiter are melting rock. And so Io is a very hot place in its interior, you know, the surface is going to be cold, but there's going to be lava flows all around. 
with Europa, which is a little farther away from Jupiter, you've got the exterior is covered by this ice shell, but inside you've got the same tidal flexing that is melting this huge ocean underneath the surface of the ice. And so as we see on Earth, wherever we find liquid water on Earth, we find life, whether it's under the ice in Antarctica, whether it's at North Pole, whether it is inside a nuclear reactor, whether it's in the most salty environments in temp intense temperatures, life seems to find a way as long as it can get access to liquid water. And there is definitely liquid water on Europa and Enceladus and a lot of these other places. If you could somehow dive down under the ice and go swimming in this, it would be cold, it would be almost the temperature of freezing at the right by the ice level. But then as you dove down closer and closer to the rocky part of the planet, the bottom of the ocean, the temperatures would rise up and rise up until it gets comfortable, and maybe even too hot to swim around in, you might roast. And we know that here on Earth, there are completely independent ecosystems down at the bottoms of the oceans, there are these black smokers, these places geothermal vents, where hot material is coming out of the Earth and going into the oceans. And there are these enormous ecosystems that are completely around these black smokers. And they are feeding off of the nutrients and the heat that's coming out of these and have no connection at all to sunlight to the surface of the planet. And so it's believed I mean, if we see that there's lava on Io, there could very well be lava on Europa, there's water, there's temperature, there's chemicals, all of the ingredients are there for life. If you took that exact same place and you brought it here to Earth, it would be filled with bacterial slime and cyanobacteria within days because all of the stuff that life needs is all there. So they're really exciting places because of the liquid water. We don't know if there are as habitable places on Mars as there are on places like Europa and Enceladus. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as other things that we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. You get an ad free experience on universetoday.com for life, even if you unsubscribe. You'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who's already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers John Ackerman, Jens Holgard Cordua, Jesse W. Harrison, Robert Davies, David Milligan, Will Shepard, Christy Melkajan, Scott Henneberry, Walter Askew, George Swain, and the rest of our members join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Neon marketing, what happens if an asteroid hits the moon while humans are on it? What safety measures do they have for the new missions concerning safety? If astronauts are on the moon when a meteorite strikes nearby, it's a very bad day. Unlike the Earth, the moon has no atmosphere to protect against atmospheric strikes. Here on Earth, if a meteorite hits the Earth, something that could be like five meters across 10 meters across, it's going to detonate in the atmosphere and not reach the surface. Things like Chelyabinsk, like Chelyabinsk was the size of a house. And yet it exploded in the atmosphere and didn't reach the surface. Now it did cause a giant blast that blew out all of the windows in the vicinity and thousands of people were injured by glass, but it didn't actually hit the earth and cause big damage, you have to get bigger than that. But on the moon, every single piece of debris is going to reach the surface of the moon and kick up dust. And in fact, the surface of the moon, the regolith, this fine powdery rock is there because of billions of years of micrometeorite impacts and large meteorite impacts striking the surface of the moon. And any astronauts on the moon would be completely unprotected, that an object could be the size of a bullet and hit the moon, no problem. So what safety measures? There are none. Um, you just hope that nothing will happen. The chances of an object actually hitting the moon and hitting a person are very rare. The moon is very big, not very many objects are hitting it at the same time. 
human beings are very small, very small target. And so the chances of somebody getting hit are very, very low. And I'm sure someone has done the math that you could go for a long time out on the surface of the moon and have a very minor chance of being hit by a meteorite. Now over longer periods of time, like say we set up some big research station on the moon, then you can start to think about what are going to be some of the dangers of having all of this out on the surface of the moon, it, it'll feel almost like an inevitability that something's going to get hit by a space rock. And there, you need to live underground, just like you want to live on Mars, you want to build your research station in a lava tube, or you want to build it in some kind of protective concrete made from the regolith so that you've got a few meters of moon rock between you and space. So that if anything small hits, it's not going to do any damage, it would take something really big, something that that maybe only hits the moon every couple of years, somewhere once on the moon to to cause any damage to your base. But but yeah, like, it, it would be unnerving to know that you're walking around on the moon as an astronaut. And there's a chance however slight that a rock's just going to come out of space and just hit you. And there's no way to protect yourself. Reverend RV, isn't it true that extraterrestrials are like us and function according to the laws of logic? And as higher life forms, shouldn't ETs be benevolent like Vulcans and not malevolent like Klingons? We have no idea what extraterrestrial civilizations would be like. Um, they could be benevolent, and they could be malevolent. We have no idea. The problem is that the ones who are malevolent the ones who are um, expansionistic are the ones we're most likely to encounter. So we probably won't encounter the benevolent aliens that just want to hang out commune with nature and be a part of their planet. We'll meet the ones who are attempting to gobble up chunks of the universe light years at a time. And because we're just they're the ones that are on the move. And it will be a very bad day for us as a civilization when we do run into one of those just kind of inevitably like the ones that we encounter will be the ones that are expanding quickly. And the way they expand quickly is by consuming the resources as they go. And you can definitely think of times in human history, where there have been many peaceful, benevolent civilizations. But those aren't the ones who people had to be fearful of living on the same planet. So if there are extraterrestrials out there, you can imagine a, a vast rainbow of personality types that they would have. They'd be like, you know, every possibility you can imagine, there's probably a civilization like that. But the ones that we will be aware of are the ones that expand quickly. DR. How do we determine how fast an object in space is traveling away from us today when the light may have been traveling for billions of years? So we only can tell what an object is doing when we're able to perceive the light. So if we see a galaxy, and we know that the light has been traveling for billions of years, then we are seeing that galaxy billions of years in the past. And that galaxy could be moving differently, could have merged with another galaxy, could have been up to all kinds of things in the intervening time. And we won't know about it until the light finally reaches us. And so astronomers just like they just don't think about what something is probably doing now. They just think about what can we observe. They look at a galaxy and they see regions of star formation. And they say there is stars forming in that galaxy. Now, those stars formed billions of years ago. And we're only just seeing the light today. But there's no way to know what is happening in that galaxy today, we have to wait for the light to arrive. And so just like in general, astronomers just think about what can I see? And what does that tell me? What's really interesting about astronomy, unlike almost any other field is that you can look out into space and see different objects that are representative of the universe at different ages, you can see things that are just a couple of light years away from us, you can see things that are 
millions of light years away from us. You can see things that are billions of light years away from us. You can see right back almost to the beginning of the universe. Simultaneously, you just look at different objects all around. And imagine if archaeologists could do something like that. They stand at the feet of the Great Pyramids, and they look in one direction, and they see a pyramid as it's being constructed and look in a different direction and see a pyramid as it had been there for a 1000 years. And then they look at the pyramid as they see it today, three different pyramids, so not the same pyramid, but three different pyramids, representing different kinds of phases that pyramids went through. And that's something that's available to astronomers that just isn't available to any other science out there. The sci fi nerd, what do you think is the greatest thing to be gained from the return to the moon? Just that we can live on the moon. Just to go like, like, I don't think there's any real justification for going to the moon. Like we go to the moon because we make better, it'll help us make better technology. Well, you could just focus on making better technology. Or we're going to go to the moon because humans can dig up a bunch of rocks better than robots can. Nah, robots are pretty good at that kind of thing. And they can bring samples back and they're it's very safe. And they're very reliable. So the only reason to send humans to the moon is to send humans to the moon. And like, why climb a mountain, you climb a mountain because it's there, you climb a mountain to have climbed the mountain. How can we have humans walking on the moon if we haven't sent humans to the moon? It's what's next. It's the next place to go. It's the next frontier. And so and the reason I say that is because I think that a lot of people will, will provide justification for why they think we should do some kind of mission like this. But then if it turns out that that justification isn't matched by some other point of view, like if someone says we should send humans to the moon because they will be great geologists, and then someone builds a robot that's the perfect geologist, then there's no reason to go to the moon. But if your reason to go to the moon is just because that's what's next, because that's what exploration means is that we explore, we go to places we've never been, we start with robots, then we send people because again, that's what's next. So what is the greatest thing that can be gained confidence, knowledge, a first step towards building a solar spanning civilization? How can we have built a solar spanning civilization if we didn't at some point go to the moon? So that's, that's, that's what it is. It is just the next step in this journey. It's humans being humans. Boomsy, do you ever get tired of speculating and not lending your intellect to progress? My job's a journalist. So, so the I don't speculate, I report, I inform, I read through all of the material that's happening, all of the new discoveries that are being made, and then I boil them down and I report them to you so that you can find out about them. And some people appreciate some people find value in somebody who is performing that function. And so that's my job. And no, I don't get tired, man, I love my job. It's so great. I mean, I get a chance like imagine when you sit down and you get a chance to have a conversation with somebody who blows your mind that is willing to answer all of your curious questions that has makes you think of things that you never thought of before. It's so rewarding. And it's so much fun. And then it, it's, you know, kind of like my job to help share those ideas with other people to try and get a wider audience to be able to keep track of what's going on. So, you know, I, I have a role in the ecosystem, I am a journalist, and that's my job. Like I had originally went to school for computer science for engineering. And I don't know if I'm really cut out for being an engineer, or being a scientist, maybe I mean, maybe now I understand it, but I don't think I was cut out for it. 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, when I was going to university. Um, but I've definitely like, found the thing that I love. And I hope for you, like, I hope you get a chance to find a career that you find as fulfilling and rewarding as I find my job, like there's role for all of this in society. And I think it's whatever you enjoy, right? Whichever you find most rewarding, I would probably be a pretty good scientist you know, now, but I don't think I would have been when I first was picking my career. 
kumquats. Are there plans for a deep sky photo that would truly test the limits of JWST, one with a total exposure of days or weeks, not the few hours of that first photo released? Good news. <laughs> this work has already been done. James Webb has done its version of the Hubble deep field. It stared at the, one of the same regions of space that Hubble did, and it stared for nine days straight. And it was able to produce a much higher resolution image of that same region is able to see galaxies that Hubble wasn't able to see, I think it resolved 100,000 galaxies when Hubble's only able to see 10,000 in that same region. And this is just the first year, this is like the first test run of a deep field from JWST. And it was already phenomenally more sensitive than anything that Hubble was able to do. So we've got 25 more years of deep fields come from JWST. Now we reported on this news in one of our space bites. So we'll just link to that. Del Barris, how could the disk of Sag A star not be aligned with the Milky Way is aligned with the rotation of the black hole or is it dependent on the direction of the incoming material? That is a great question. We don't know. I mean, so, the, so for the longest time, astronomers assumed that the spin of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way was lined up with the rotation, the spin axis of the Milky Way itself. But for the last couple of years, there have been some interesting ideas that maybe it's not lined up. And with this image from the Event Horizon Telescope, showing the image and be able to actually figure out how it's aligned. It's not. It's kind of roughly pointed towards Earth, like like 30 degrees away from Earth. So it's not pointed at us. But it is definitely not lined up with the rotation of the Milky Way. Why? We don't know. Um, one possibility is from a collision, like another supermassive black hole crashed into the Milky Way supermassive black hole. It could also be that that through the mergers of various galaxies, material fell down into the black hole differently than it forms the rest of the disk of the Milky Way. So it's a mystery. This is what's so wonderful about science that you get this surprising result. And you have to then figure out why what's going on. And over time, can you imagine we'll get to this time when scientists have built a bigger version of the event horizon telescope, something that is maybe out in space, maybe there's a one on the moon that is adding to the event horizon telescope. And now they're able to image thousands of supermassive black hole event horizons around us. And they'll be able to know, oh, what do you know, all of them are lined up with their galaxies, except for the Milky Way's one, that's weird, or none of them are lined up with their host galaxies. So the Milky Way is totally normal. We don't know yet, but that's why you keep searching. And that's why you build bigger instruments and keep going after those new questions. Jason Rivard, what do you think are the odds of a base on Mars being established this century are? I think they're good. I like I don't think there's going to be a city on Mars of a million people by the end of the century, like some people are hoping like, like Mars sucks. And I think that people will start to discover how bad Mars is. <laughs> Someone said this was it wait, but why I think he said, Mars is terrible. And if it was anywhere on Earth, nobody would want to live there. And, and so I mean, like the only thing Mars has going for it is that it's not Earth. Um, but I do think there'll be a research station there. Absolutely. I mean, I think that within 20 years, we will have a permanently inhabited research station on the moon. And I'd say within 30 years, we will have a permanently inhabited research station on Mars. So definitely before the end of the century, and whether it's NASA, whether it's SpaceX, whether it's China, whether it's an international collaboration, someone will be building this base on various places across the solar system. And like, I know we're impatient. Like we just want this expanse, this Star Trek future that that science fiction has been promising us. But you live in a time when there are 1000s of satellites orbiting around the Earth, there are rovers on Mars and the moon, we have sent spacecraft to every planet in the solar system and Pluto, some may consider a planet, we have telescopes out at the L2 Lagrange point, like it's, it's happening. It's just happening more slowly than you had hoped. But I think that be patient. 
And it might not happen in our generation, but it might happen in your kid's generation or in your grandkids generation or your great grandkids. It's okay. These things take time. It's inevitable though. That's the other part of this is that it's all inevitable that as I mentioned earlier on in the episode, that's what's next. We will inevitably go to what's next. It might not happen as soon as you were hoping, but come back a couple hundred years from now, and the solar system is going to look like a completely different place. Random dad. I was watching a video about using lasers to push probes to speed for long trips, given a power source. Couldn't we just take the laser with the probe and shoot it backwards? Absolutely. You could fire a laser off of the back of a spaceship. And as the photons left the laser, they would impart momentum on the spacecraft. And what's amazing about that is that the speed of the photons leaving the rocket is the speed of light, which is the highest possible speed that you can leave. That is the fastest specific impulse that you can get way faster than a chemical rocket, way faster than an ion engine. You are faster than a fusion drive, faster than antimatter, anything. You are blasting these photons out the back of your rocket at light speed and you will get a kick. But you mentioned the given a power source and then you said question mark and exclamation mark and you hit the nail on the head. The problem is the power source that what power source will you put on your spaceship to be able to power this photonic drive and have it work the more the heavier the fuel, the heavier the the power source, then the more mass your spaceship has and the harder it is for the laser to accelerate it. You need some kind of external power source that you can then harvest the energy to be able to run your photonic drive. And so that's why the problem is, is that you need a dense form of energy like antimatter or fusion, right? It's about the density of like, it's almost like a battery, like think about the power source as your battery. And hydrogen and oxygen is a very inefficient battery, while an ion engine is a more efficient battery. But the most efficient one is probably going to be antimatter. So you could have like a antimatter power plant on your spaceship that is firing a photonic drive, a laser at the back of the spaceship, and that would work. You just need to figure out how to build an antimatter factory or antimatter power plant. All right. Those were all the questions that we had today. Thank you everyone who asked them both in the YouTube comments as well as in the live chat. Super fun. Remember, we do the show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So come join us, hang out. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the Galaxy Wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.